without further ado, I will invite Hilary to take us through the next session. This is Hilary. Yes, Hilary. Yes. You pick on protection. Yes. You were protecting the elephants. Yes. I, uh, I saw that. And now you are on a different, kind of different uh, line of duty. How do you feel about the protection you did in the past for our elephants? Even now I'm protecting wildlife. <laughs> I think research is one of the ways to protect wildlife and wild spaces because data, information, is what guides planning. So for instance, if you don't know how many elephants are left in the Laikipia landscape or even in Kenya, and you can extend that even to the continent, if you don't know where they are going, how they are using the landscapes, if you don't know how they are interacting with humans, you know, what beyond anecdotal evidence, beyond what people are saying, you need to be able to back that with data. Because a lot of times, perception is not always backed by data. People can scream and shout, oh, elephants are killing people, they are finishing all our crops, and then when you go and measure, you realize actually baboons and squirrels <laughs> and rats <laughs> destroy more, more than elephants. And because elephants are visible, they're charismatic and political, you see you can get a meeting together if you shout about elephants or lions, but if you shout about rats, nobody will come. <laughs> so, Elephants being charismatic, or lions for that matter, they tend to get more attention. And so people will shout, oh, um, elephants are eating all our crops. Well, actually goats, according to the research we've done, goats, livestock, you know, generally, um, rats, other rodents, destroy more crops than Elephants will ever do. <laughs> yes. Climate change, extinction, and uh, human wildlife conflict mm -hmm. has continued to become issues of our time. Mm -hmm. You are in Nepal, mm -hmm. which is one of the largest or the leading ecological centers of research in Africa. Mm -hmm. How are you now in this space mm -hmm. building capacity to the scholars around? the community. How has that been for you? Right. So, indeed, um, climate change is probably the most important ecological issue that we are facing. In fact, we don't even know the a fraction of what climate change actually means for us and how it's going to change our world. I'll give you an example. Recently, I was sitting with a researcher who was talking about some ants called big-headed ants. Now, these ants have always been here in this landscape. In small nests, small numbers. Eh? But recently, their numbers have increased so much they are advancing almost like bushfire. So what is the reason? The drought that we just suffered, the three year drought that we suffered, has actually been an advantage for those ants. So now they are advancing. What is the problem of these ants advancing? They are really they eat every other ant on their advance. Right now, the ants we are most worried about are the ones that protect acacias. I don't know how many of you know of the whistling thorn acacia. Yes? It, the Latin name is Acacia drepanolobia. Now, this acacia is a very important woodland acacia in our... You go to Nairobi Park, in particularly all our bushlands, you will find this acacia. The reason why it has those black or in those black pods are some ants that stay inside. Mm -hmm. The value of these ants is that they scare away 
giraffes, zebra, and other herbivores that feed on this acacia. So the giraffes will come, and when they start feeding, the ants come out and scare them. They will still feed, but they won't finish everything. If you kill the ants, the giraffes, the elephants, when they come to feed, there's nothing to scare them. So they will finish <laughs> the acacias. Nature has developed that symbiosis so that the acacias never get finished. There is always enough to feed these herbivores because herbivores are just like us. If there is nothing to stop us, we just eat and eat and eat, right? <laughs> but there is enough, but then they unscare them so that the acacias can. So what we are looking at now, going forward, is if this advance of the big-headed ants continues, especially towards the north of Mpala and many of the other surrounding ranches, the Acacia drepanolobium is at the risk of disappearing. Okay. And if it disappears, all the herbivores that depend on it, because it's a very hardy plant, will have a challenge surviving. We are talking about rhinos, elephants, giraffes. So this is an impact of climate change, just one, that because of very long drought period, these ants have now been able to exist beyond what nature was able to check them. During the rains, they die because their nests get flooded, <laughs> you see? But if there is no rain, they are just staying in their nests and reproducing. When it starts raining a bit and they've got food to advance, they can now advance in huge numbers. I don't know whether you're seeing how graphic this unpredictable long droughts, unpredictable rainstorms, the impact they're going to have on our world. I'm just telling you about what we can see. There are other things we cannot see. Viruses, we can't see the microorganisms in the soil that are also benefiting from the changes. So we are seeing, for instance, that when it rains, our cattle are having a serious problem when they eat the fresh green growth. They all start having diarrhea. Why? Because there are all these microorganisms have been sitting in the soil. They've had a fantastic time to just hibernate. And then when it rains a bit, they all over reproduce. And then our cows are hungry, they've not had grass for a long time, they become gluttons, they eat too many of these microorganisms that are in the soil. And then we start losing cows. We are lucky because we are monitoring. Imagine that farmer, that pastoralist, who is out there in Samburu, desperate to move their cattle to where the next green grass is, and happy that there is grass, but not knowing that now, because there has been this long drought, there are other microorganisms in the soil that are going to kill these cows. That what was a celebration before, it's rained, there is grass, is no longer something to celebrate. Actually, you should hide your cows and continue giving them hay or whatever kept them alive for a period until these microorganisms naturally decline. But nobody is showing the farmers. That's why you need research. And about the ants, what are you doing about it? It's very interesting because we can do very little at the moment. We are still at the point where we are doing research on how to manage them. There are some countries where they've tried biological control, introducing some fungus that destroy them in their nests. There are certain insecticides that have been used in some countries. Some countries have used burning, controlled burning, you burn a strip so that they are not able to advance. But all those measures have their negative impact. So we are just now trying to fundraise to test. Because if you're testing biological control, you don't want that control to kill other ants. So you have to test and check. The insecticide, you have to check that it's not going to kill something else that you need. The fire line, you must make sure that you are burning just enough to control the advance of the ants. And you must be careful to check what else you are burning. So 
there's no easy answer to this problem, but it's a problem. At least we know it's there. Right. And more to those who don't even know. I'm um, interested to in know what are some of the programs that you've come up with uh, to enhance conservation mm -hmm. of, of everything around this place and even in the country mm -hmm. uh, in terms of engagement in the community. In the process of finalizing our strategic plan and one of the pillars is people. Because we've realized it is not, it is very important for us to disseminate the results of our research, that unless the research we are doing here can solve real world problems. If our research just ends up in publications, if our research just ends up creating more PhDs, <laughs> you know, and more beautiful documents, and does not solve the problem of that man who woke up this morning and all he wanted was to move his cattle from the boma, take the cattle to grace, and does not know that there are big-headed ants out there that is competing with. This guy does not know that there are different fungus and microorganisms in the soil that he has to battle with. This person is set up. This person does not know the impact of the invasive species, which I'm sure you have seen here, the opuntia, um, and other plants that were introduced here. They were looking very innocent, but now with climate change, they have completely changed the way they are interacting in the ecosystem. And sometimes our people don't know. And so we have taken it on as an obligation and our researchers now know that when they write a proposal, we require them to disseminate those results to the communities. Now, challenge. All this knowledge, all this information needs to be used. Our people, they are already stressed just waking up in the morning and staying alive. <laughs> So we need synergies, we need to collaborate with others, county government, development organizations, those who now work in agricultural, um, maybe production people, so that we can now use targeted interventions by those who have the resources, who work in community development, that our research starts to inform how, for instance, they discuss livestock production. Our research should be able to inform how they advise farmers on movement and disease, right? So it doesn't just stop at informing people because that information is great, but how does it empower me if I can't use it? Yeah, if I'm not given the resources to change what I am doing so that I can improve my life. So there is lots of collaborations, lots of synergies that we need to develop and we are indeed trying to develop. In fact, today my uh, chief operations officer is in a community meeting in a place called Koija. The other day we joined the, a foundation, WIS Foundation, who are working in the community to help with land restoration. So what we are doing is, yes, we bring our information in the spaces where development agents, agricultural agents, can now use that data to change what they're teaching communities. So it doesn't just stop at doing research and getting information. It's passing that information and making sure that it's being used to change something. The research or you involve them at the information point? Good question. Very good question. Indeed, citizen science or involving people at the point where you're collecting data is really important because they even value that data more. Are we doing that as much as we would like to? Probably not. Probably not. For all sorts of reasons, including the way that research is traditionally organized. Okay? Researchers go out seek research grants, they come with a particular pot of money for a particular piece of work. 
Now, for ourselves as Mpala, having realized the importance of having our people interact at that level of research, we are now looking for specific pots of money first to bring in Kenyan students, Kenyans, Kenyan researchers to participate, not just in long-term research, but even short-term groups that are coming here. We make sure that they appreciate the need to interact closely with the Kenyan public, Kenyan researchers. We can do more. We can certainly do more. We can invite more people in the community to work with us. When we have, for instance, a census, a giraffe census, we want to see the mamas from Olga Boli coming here with their shukas, with binoculars, we teach them how to use them, we show them this is how giraffes interact. They know a little more about giraffes. They already know a lot. They could probably teach us quite a lot, but there's still some stuff you can correct by giving them data. So for instance, whenever I've done work in elephant, uh, with communities around elephants, they all think that the big elephant at the front is a male. This is not true. Even you probably think the same. Now I want you to correct that perception. Elephants are matriarchal. They are led by females. They figured this thing a long time ago that the world should be led by females. <laughs> <laughs> and they are very successful families. And what happens is, by the time males are 13 years, they are chased away from the herd. Actively chased away. They hang out on the peripheries. They only come when they are needed to mate. And they are chosen carefully. The ones that look like they have good genes of longevity and health are the ones that are allowed to mate. The ones that are rega rega not so healthy, not so strong, they are not welcome. So because of that uh, focus in the society, elephants are very, very successful. Do you see why the world should be led by females? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, last one from me before yes. we get uh, a few questions from my colleagues. Yes. Um, Dr. Lee, let's talk about the policies and the compensation thing that is going around. Mm -hmm. Uh, in your, you just spoke about the your strategic plan that you mm -hmm. have mm -hmm. as an advocate for protection of your wildlife mm -hmm. and as an ecologist. What are some of the elements you have in terms of the policies mm -hmm. you would want them to be looked by both governments, the county and the national? Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, that's a heavy one. That's a big one because it's a big conversation. Okay, first, let me start by saying that uh, Kenya has really tried hard to do the work, you know? Because without a policy and legislative framework that is actively being discussed and reviewed and discussed and reviewed, you've lost the battle, yeah? In this country, as early as 1975, we actually had a white paper, a session of paper that said, you know, the only way we're going to be able to look after our wildlife is if we involve the community. You know that? 1975, the most progressive wildlife policy in the whole of Africa was here in Kenya. Kenya is one of the first countries to sign, for instance, the CITES Convention, the Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species. The first meeting of IUCN, the International Union for, uh, uh, I keep forgetting what this Congress is, it was here in Kenya. Kenya has done the work. We've been battling with this thing of conservation policy and legislation for years. Okay? So, if you think about it, protected areas, we have at least 12% of our land area, you know? <coughs> then we have Kenya Wildlife Conservancy Association. They've added an equal 12% maybe of community lands to conservation. So actively convincing cons uh, communities that look, conservation is something you should consider. Yeah? So, in terms of policy, can 
India has really tried to do a work. Now, has that work necessarily translated in successful wildlife conservation? In some areas, we have recorded some really serious success. In our mega herbivores, because we are good at focusing on the big things. Maybe because <laughs> we are very tourism oriented, so the big five are important to us. So if you look at, for instance, elephant conservation, we've been able to build our elephant conservation, our elephant population from 50,000 elephants, which is what we had in 1993 when I joined conservation. We had only 16,000 elephants left. I spent a lot of time in forest counting down because we could not see the elephants. Because there were so few, they were hiding so well, we used to count down, check whether they've pooped, we count the poop, just to be sure that there are elephants in that forest. That's what we count. If it's pooped, well, at least we know there's an elephant, even if it has <laughs> diarrhea, it's still an elephant. <laughs> we just wanted to confirm the one there, okay? To, today, when we have close to 40,000 elephants, right? So, in just a period of 30 years, yeah, we've been able to recover our elephant population. And it's taken a lot of work, you know, a lot of effort. Our anti-poaching campaigns have been serious. Remember, we are a, a country that is surrounded by countries where small arms are raging everywhere. Yes? You to go and rent an AK-47 to decimate an elephant herd is too easy. Because we are neighbored by countries where either there is civil war, there is, you know, many good sources. And also, once you've gotten your ivory, to traffic it through a country that is a failed state is very easy, isn't it? So, the work, anti poaching work that has been done in this country is remarkable. Our rhino population, we have built our rhino population from less than 150 rhinos in those 1990s to now we have close to 1,300 rhinos. Wow. It might not look like a lot, but you know, rhinos are some of the most unsuccessful characters when it comes to mating. I don't know where they are very big, they keep falling off. But, <laughs> they, 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 but they, we built a population of both white and black rhinos under the most amazing odds because the price of rhino horn has actually never reduced. Mm. The rhino horn price continues to be... To South Africa, even last year, they lost the same number of rhinos we have, 1,200 rhinos, uh. last year were killed in South Africa. The year before, they lost a similar number of rhinos. We are bordered by some of the most insecure countries around us. You can kill rhino, you can move the horn very easily if we were not as vigilant as we are. So okay. are you saying we are doing better? We are successful with the big things, yeah? But there are other things which we have not looked after very well. We haven't done very well with this human wildlife conflict business, which has to do with the fact that we've never really had a good land use policy. Land has always been an emotive issue in this country. And so, when we develop land use plans, even local ones, they fail very quickly. Yeah? Because land has never really been something we have been able to deal with. So what happens, what we need to do as a country is to first of all call ourselves for a meeting and agree whether wildlife is a resource. Look at the returns we are getting from this resource vis-a-vis -vis what is coming out of all the other. And place wildlife properly in our economy. And it's not difficult. Most tourists who come to Kenya, maybe 70%, they come here to see wildlife, mm -hmm. isn't it? Mm -hmm. The tourists come here to see wildlife, which is the highest income earner in this country, foreign exchange earner. Mm -hmm. Tourism, isn't it? So why is it hard <laughs> for us to appreciate that even in terms of forces of production, we really should secure land 
for wildlife because it pays. Okay? Wildlife is a heritage. Even if it did pay as a cent, we really should look after it because it takes care of our ecosystems. Yeah? But here we're even looking after something that pays. Yes? The wildlife economy, the tourism economy in this country is real. Yeah? So it should be so difficult for the government to understand that they should put their money where the money is coming from. So we're always talking, let's build industries, let's build, let's build electric lines to wildlife areas, let's build SGRs. Nobody comes here to see trains. And in fact, we are never going to produce, we're never going to be that country. They call us Singapore. No. No. I think that's a wrong aspiration. The way the world is going now, people will be paying for oxygen cash money. Oxygen. Did you see what happened during COVID? If you lived in a city like Beijing, you know people will think people died in China for nothing. If you live in Beijing, your lungs are already operating at zero because it's so polluted. So if a respiratory disease comes up, you just die. Why did we survive COVID in this country? Because we have a lot of oxygen free. So what other countries don't have? is what we have. Our green areas, this wildlife that keeps those areas alive, that would be the most valuable, sellable product. And I don't even think it will be 20 years from now. Somebody in New York will be phoning a school and saying, I want to bring my child there. Do you have oxygen? <laughs> a school which has no oxygen will get no children because there will be so much pollution. Those kids will all have no lungs. And so they will need supplemental oxygen to survive. But us here, people call us primitive, will be here is, uh, having free. So be my good friend because in Pala there will be oxygen when you finish <laughs> off. <laughs> you know, you guys can think this is an idle conversation. But really, I don't know how many of you have been to cities like Beijing, Santiago in Chile. You wake up in the morning. You try and go for a walk. If you're like me, who is addicted to a morning walk, I don't run, but I walk. You go back to your hotel room very fast because you can't breathe. So these industries that we are trying to build here to finish the oxygen God has given us for free, that oxygen will be the most sellable commodity. 20 years. And what are we doing here? We are trying to be like Singapore for what? When we are destroying the one thing the whole world will be looking for in just 20 years. So, our natural world, looking after our forests, looking after our world spaces, looking after our wildlife, is having vision because the future is green. The rest of the world will be paying us top dollar to just come here to breathe, just to breathe. They will pay top dollar to come and breathe. Now they won't even be wanting to see elephants. Because they people will be walking around with oxygen tanks. We don't have a laptop. If you're in a city like New York or Toronto, or you will be carrying oxygen, your own oxygen. So the future is green. And I, if I had three minutes with the president, three minutes, I'll tell him, my sir, we are sitting on the future. It's here. Let's look after what we have. In another 20, 30 years, watch now we are starting to sell carbon. Yeah? We'll be selling oxygen. It will be more expensive than carbon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, <laughs>